Alright guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Justin, and this is Please Wake Up. I'm jumping right, honestly this is directly after the last video. No time has passed. I just wanted to split things up to make it easier on you guys. So let's jump right back in. Uh, do remember that this game has like flashing lights and colors. Uh, it, it, there was a warning that it could like temporarily for long periods of time affect your vision uh, as well as concepts in the game can bring about you know weird feelings existential dread type stuff so if that's not your thing if you can't handle any of that please click away now or you go up here and I'll link you a different video to watch something else all right let's jump in we've learned a lot from epilepsy surgeries during an epileptic seizure bursts of electrical activity spread throughout the brain in extreme cases, surgery is done to stop this spread by cutting out or isolating certain parts and pathways in the brain. Uh, one of the most well-known examples of such cases is of a man we call H.M. The surgeons had cut out his hippocampus in an attempt to reduce his epileptic seizures. They were successful at getting rid of his seizures, but there was a severe side effect. He was unable to form any new memories. Uh, this case is why we now know that the hippocampus is used for the consolidation and creation of memory. Another way this used to be God. done was by severing what's called the corpus Immediately callus. into the bullshit. This part of the brain Ugh. connects the brain's left and right hemispheres. We call those who underwent this process split brain patients. And this can also reduce epileptic seizures. Uh, it does in some cases, and at first glance it doesn't even seem to have any obvious side effects. If you ask the patients if they feel any different, they would say that they don't. On most cognitive tests, they have similar performance. In fact, some even increased in IQ. They could go about I, their normal I don't lives notice no anything different. Oh, thank you. Their personalities and emotions were also the same. Uh, but upon closer inspection, done by Roger Sperry and Michael Gazaniga in the 1960s, the patients who underwent this procedure displayed some curious behavior. What types of behaviors? You know how they say that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body? Right? Well... When you sever the connection between those two sides of the brain, the two sides of the body can end up acting independently. Uh, for example, they're able to draw a picture with their right and left hand simultaneously. Well, that's a neat little party trick. <laughs> we can experience one of these a didn't have a of door. I don't remember which one. The, brain patients. the first experiment conducted by Sperry and Gazaniga had a simple Oof. premise. The patient would sit in front of two lights, one of which could be viewed by the right eye, the other by the left. The lights would each Wait, I thought this flash. side was blue. Wait, no, that side's which blue. Lights flash, the patient would only say the light on the right flashed, despite the fact that both lights flashed. So they couldn't see the light flash on the left. Well, this is where it gets interesting. When asked to point at the lights that flash, they correctly managed to point at both. Wait, so they, they, they could see it? Yes, but when asked, they still said they only saw the flash Shit. on the right. Why is that? It's because the center for speech in the brain is usually located in the left hemisphere of the brain. So when asked to respond, only that hemisphere was capable of doing so. That hemisphere of the brain can only see the right. Since the connection between the two hemispheres was severed, the right hemisphere couldn't communicate what it saw to the left hemisphere. However, when asked to point, each side of the brain has access to one arm, so the right side was able to control the left arm to point when the light flashed. So, uh, it seems like there can be two independent minds inside the skull that independently perceive and act. But how come the patients report everything being the same? Wouldn't the left side of the brain realize that it's not receiving any information from the right side? Now, that's a good question. In another experiment, the researchers showed two different images of the two different hemispheres of a split-brain patient. The left hemisphere saw a picture of a chicken's claw. The right hemisphere saw a picture of a snowy suit. The experimenters then showed a large selection of pictures and asked the patient to see oh, the most shit. relevant one from the scene. The patient's right hand pointed to a chicken. The oh, this is extremely difficult for me right now. was shoveled because of the snow. When the patient was asked why he pointed at the chicken, the patient said it was because he saw a picture of a chicken. This makes sense because his left hemisphere, which is responsible for speech, saw the picture of the chicken. Uh, here's where it gets interesting. When asked why his other hand was pointing at the shovel, the patient, without hesitation, said, You need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. Now, the patient wasn't intentionally lying. The left hemisphere of his brain legitimately believes that's why he pointed at that object. 
his brain just kind of made up the reason on the spot. We call this confabulation. So why did he confabulate? One popular explanation is that healthy people actually confabulate all the time. It's what our left hemisphere just naturally does. It creates stories to explain our actions and feelings to ourselves. This is why the patients don't feel any different. Our conscious perception of a self that makes decisions is mostly an illusion anyways. It's simply impossible for a human being to have an objective, outside perspective on themselves at all times. <sighs> wait, wait, what do you mean that we confabulate all the time? Well, <clears throat> have you ever wondered why you did or said something? You tend to kind of just come up with an explanation or a story and confidently believe it to be true. But that's all it is. A story. There's no inherent reason to believe that your explanation you gave to yourself is the true reason behind your decision. <laughs> oh god! Fuck, that one's hard. Oh. Fuck. We've learned a lot I... from epilepsy surgeries. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why you did or said something? You tend to kind of just come up with an explanation or a story and confidently believe it to be true. But that's all it is. A story. There's no inherent reason to believe that your explanation you gave to yourself is the true reason behind your decision. In fact, a lot of research seems to point to the idea that our subconscious brain is mostly making our decisions, and our conscious mind is just along for the ride. Uh, this is a little bit beyond no, the No, shit, that's not what I wanted. Research bum, has shown that we can use bum, bum, to predict a person's decisions up to bum, seven bum, seconds before they are even consciously no, aware bum, they made them, which has some truly interesting implications for what we refer to as free will. Interesting. So, if the left brain is the one that we speak to and interact with, does that mean that we can say that that side of the brain contains the conscious mind, but the left hemisphere is the person? Uh, it's tempting to believe that, but it would still raise several unanswered questions. If that's true, that would mean that the other hemisphere is a separate, independent entity inside of your head that perceives the world and makes decisions. How do we know that that part of the brain isn't conscious? After all, the ability to perceive, think, and make decisions is how we know other humans are conscious. Uh, one patient described how, when getting dressed, one hand would try to put on his pants while the other, which personally didn't want to get dressed, attempted to pull down. This same patient also talked about an incident in which he tried to strike his wife with his left hand while his right hand grabbed the left hand in an attempt to stop it. Also, the right hemisphere in the brain is responsible for a lot of other important tasks, such as facial recognition. If you were only the left hemisphere in your brain, you wouldn't be able to recognize your loved ones. So what's oh, your shit. explanation? In healthy humans, are there two entities inside your head? If that's not the case, how does splitting it in two oh, shit. create two new, independent, conscious entities? There are a lot of theories around these ideas. Uh, personally, I have no idea. I think there's not enough evidence to support any particular theory. So far, the only thing I can conclude from this is that we have absolutely no idea how the brain works. We have no idea what consciousness is, or whether we have free will. There's a lot left to be discovered here, which is very, very exciting. Mm, and also terrifying. Breaking news, we have new developments okay, coming out of the, uh, No! Authorities say that John McCullough has left a note at his latest kidnapping of 13-year-old Thomas Mandela at Torrid County Middle School. The note confirms that he is behind the kidnapping. Mr. McCullough had recently no. prison no, no, under no, no, several no, no, charges no, no, no. of medical malpractice at the now-closed Kirkbride Psychiatric Hospital and is believed to have kidnapped his son, Timothy McCullough, who is recovering from an unspecified illness at a local hospital. Oh, I survived. I survived it. If you have any information regarding their whereabouts, please call 911. Oh, thank you. All right, next. And good evening. We have exclusive details. A new oh, this communication is that could be from John McCullough, the alleged kidnapper of the two missing children. Earlier today, we received a letter that appears oh, to be this is from Mr. McCullough, although investigators are still confirming its origins. The note reads as follows. My son has fallen ill and has only a few days to live. The government has kept him locked up in a sham hospital with packs for doctors. They are claiming that his condition is terminal despite the fact that I know exactly Remember what this? 
They're just looking to harvest his organs for money. I will transfer parts of Timothy's hippocampus to a new body. He will be able to retain his recent memories and continue his conscious identity. I have performed similar surgeries with resounding success. These hospitals are choosing to kill patients instead of saving lives because it's cheaper. The public should be aware of this. They should see the lies we are being fed. They will see the proof when Timothy is healthy tomorrow. Until then, please do not look for me. To respond to the I don't have know what's different. Dr. Kenneth Ulrich. Kenneth? Thank you, Nora. Mr. McCulloch, if you are listening, do not attempt this operation. Medical experts state that such a surgery will likely result in the death of both children and that the desired outcome cannot be achieved with current medical technology. For the sake of Thomas Mandela's family, as well as the life of your own son, do not attempt this surgery. And what of his claims of being a successful neurosurgeon? These claims are false. Mr. McCulloch was hired as a neurosurgeon at the Kirkbride Psychiatric Hospital for two and a half years with a fake medical license. He was arrested for medical malpractice and the hospital was shut down after it was discovered that he was performing highly experimental and illegal surgeries on his patients. Many of these surgeries resulted in permanent loss of cognitive functions as well as death. All right, thank you, Dr. Ulrich. Up next, we have interviews with the Mandela and McCullough families, both pleading for the safe return of their children. Currently, we have with us Dr. James Mass, an acclaimed neurosurgeon who specializes in dealing with comatose patients. His research, which involves a new method of awakening comatose patients, is currently in the final stages of clinical trials. Tell us about how you started along this line of research. So my work builds off of the work of a man named Dr. Adrian Owen. His oh, that was creepy. That some comatose patients are fully aware of their surroundings, but are unable to respond or consciously control oh, their shit. bodies. He proved this by using fMRI scanners, which would allow him to observe a comatose patient's brain activity patterns. Different thoughts produce different brain activity patterns. For example, thinking about playing tennis activates a different area of the brain than thinking about moving around one's house. Uh, with this, he was able to ask the patient a question and then tell them to I think don't about see anything change. Yes, and to think about navigating through their house to indicate no. Um, yet, Damn many it. comatose patients do show brain activity, but are still completely unaware of their surroundings. I was curious about what these patients were thinking of and Door. experiencing. Was it relaxing? Was it frightening? What I wanted to do was to communicate with these comatose patients on a very basic level. And how did you accomplish that? Oh, well, it's quite complicated. Many comatose oh. patients are unable to access their lower level sensory inputs, such as their vision or hearing. However, we can map the neural patterns from those low sensory inputs to <laughs> I can't, I can't get it. I can't, I can't get it. I can't keep up. That was too hard. I'm gonna need a break. My brain is killing me. My head's killing me. The freaking red and the green. Oh, it's killing my head. So, that, that was, oh, that was, please wake up. Second part. There's more, but it'll have to be a different time. Different time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, head right down below it, hit the like button for me, hit the subscribe button, and turn on notifications. That way you'll be alerted the next time I upload a video, and this will have been worth something. I do upload every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for my horror gaming content, and if you yourself happen to be a content creator or a live streamer, I have a completely separate channel where I create educational and informative content for you to help you grow in your channel. If you're interested in that, 
All the links will be in the description as well as the link to my Twitch. I do live stream every Tuesday and Thursday evening, so feel free to come by, watch me play some horror games or some indie content, and bring all of your questions, comments, and concerns as a creator, and I will address them live. Thanks for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Bye.